Luck doesn't come to you. You find luck. You create luck. You have to create every circumstance for it to want to be present. The people that you want to keep closest to you that you admire are mirrors. They see you more clearly than you can see yourself. Mm, and you have so to true. trust the way they see you. When I launched this podcast, I knew I was going to bring Jamie on because she is one of the most inspiring people that I know. In 2021, she had just left her very successful corporate job in tech, and she launched her business specializing in skincare and beauty rituals. She is the most coveted esthetician in Austin and Central Texas. Her books are constantly full. Her business is growing so fast, and really the world is her oyster. So I'm so excited to bring her in to talk about how she got to where she is and what are her mindsets for success. I want you to listen to how she talks about overcoming the challenges that she's experienced in her life. She's extremely self-aware and deeply reflective about all of her experiences, and she really owns them, meaning she has taken the time to integrate them into her life, her mindset, and her approach to new challenges. I'm so excited for you to listen. So let's get started. People fly in from all over the country to see you. And to me, you are just the de facto expert on Korean skincare and aesthetics. So like, I don't trust anyone else with my skin. I know a lot of people feel that way as well. <laughs> so I just want people to hear how you got into this journey and everything that you've learned and all your mindsets and, and attitudes that you've just experienced going through it. So I guess to start, when you left your corporate job in 2018, did you know that you were going to start on this path? No. So I thought I was just quitting a job that wasn't like a toxic job and that I would stay in the corporate world and maybe get myself a promotion and move it to like a better company. I was chronically working for small companies or startups. So I thought, oh, maybe it's time for me to elevate out of a startup and move into like a, you know, a more structured corporation. So that's what I thought I was going to do. So I started applying to jobs and then I'd get really excited when I'd get the interview. I would do well at the interviews and then I would get job offers and then I would like feel depressed. A little bit of imposter syndrome, like, oh, no, maybe I can't do it. Like, maybe maybe I'm, like, not good enough to actually move on. Like, maybe things didn't work out because everything they thought about me not being good enough was true. And then also, I just didn't want to work. <laughs> like, I felt tired because for the past, uh, like, five years before that, I put in a lot of myself into my former job, proving to myself that I could do it. Proving to other people that I was capable, but a lot of times it's just like my own perfectionism. So I put 100%, more than 100% into that job. And then being like, oh, you know what? I think I'm burnt out. I'm just going to take a break. And then I thought I would just take like a couple of months because my dad was also sick with cancer. And we had a trip uh, going to Japan. We'd take an annual trip with my family to, to Tokyo. And that was in May. So I was like, I'm just gonna coast till May. Like, I'm just not gonna do anything. And after about a month, I started going like stir crazy and then getting very depressed mm. because I realized I burnt out because I actually like working. Um, but when the environment isn't healthy, you're going to burn out, you're overworking. And so doing nothing started leading me to like really bad depression. And then I'm like on social media, I, started looking at going to school in general. Like I was like, I'm going to go to ACC and I'm going to learn Korean. That's what I thought I would do <laughs> because I watch a ton of Korean dramas. My mom is Korean and I'm like, oh, it'd be really nice to like not have to read subtitles. Yeah. At the same time, I was helping my friend Marnie with her skin because when I worked at my tech job, she worked with me and she always used to be fascinated by my skin because we would go on these company retreats and I would always like go in my room and like do my skincare and put on sheet masks. And I would spend a lot of time by myself pampering myself. Mm. And she was like, oh, that's so cool. We had to share a room at one retreat. So she saw me doing it and was very interested. So it just so happens that when I had quit, we I mean, we've been friends for a long time. 
So she was just talking about how like, oh, you know, at the last retreat, I was just watching you do all your skincare and I'm so jealous. I'm never going to have pretty skin. And I'm like, oh, you can totally have pretty skin and I will fix it. You want me to fix it for you? I go, I can just fix it with products. And she's all like, seriously? I was like, yeah. So I was helping her build the skincare routine. And then we would just do like check-ins to see how things were going. And honestly, this was fun for me because it's like, um, you know, like personal shoppers. Mm -hmm. You still get dopamine hits when you shop with other people's money. (laughs) So I was like excited. I was like, I'm just going to buy all this skincare. And she was very like, oh, there's, I will spend all the money. I'm cool with it. So I was having a lot of fun doing this for her and just like helping her. Her skin was starting to transform and she was like, I can't believe that my face looks like this. And I was all like, wow. yeah, I go, I go, most people just don't know how to do this. And, you know, like I was just personally self-obsessed with it. And then she just goes, how did you learn how to do this? Like, <clears throat> oh, self-taught or how you just researched it on YouTube or on the internet? Yeah. Okay. So I think one, I had, I have really good genetics, right? Mm-hmm. So I have nice skin. <laughs> I it's, uh, you know, everyone's like gen- genetics are a big part of it. So I've always had nice skin, but all Asian girls experience their first cliff around 30. Mm. And I hit my first cliff and I was confused. My mom was always obsessed with skincare. So immediately I'm like, okay, well, my whole life, my mom was using Shiseido. So people yeah. don't realize this, but back in the day, they Shiseido was actually the only like luxury brand. Mm-hmm. I immediately just went to, I think like Nordstrom, because they had like a, not Nordstrom, Macy's, and they had like a, a Shiseido yeah. counter. And I just went there and I'm like, I need skincare. And then she was looking at me and she basically recommended a whole line and I got it and it wasn't working for me. Like I didn't like it. It was making my skin feel rougher. So then I was confused. So I would just start picking lines based on the way they were advertised and I couldn't get results. Based on your needs. Too, yeah. So like fit. I'm doing like, I think I chose like anti-aging Okay. and I still wasn't seeing results. This is why people become product obsessed mm-hmm. because products aren't performing the way you want them to. So you're always interested in another product. If something's working, you don't really want to switch out of it, right? Mm. So like serially switching from yes. one thing to the other, which is what I did too, yes. because I couldn't find anything that worked for me. And then there's the funness of like new skincare too, right? Yeah. That's a big part of it. So then I just kind of became addicted to products and I had a ridiculous amount of products everywhere. But my skin was just okay. Mm-hmm. Or something would work really well at first and then it wouldn't really work. Taper off. And I would be confused by this. So... It just led me down the path of learning how skincare works. So that I'm like, okay, well, picking products based on like the name is not working. What are all these ingredients doing? Mm -hmm. And then when I looked at the stack of ingredients, I was all like, oh my God, I don't even know what to do with this. So lucky for us, the internet exists and you can actually research any ingredient and then you'll get like like a medical site, like the ingredients and we'll, it'll give you like the clinical or like the scientific use of that product. And then it'll like also like say, oh, they used in skincare. So I'm like, okay. So I started learning what ingredients basically were responsible for Mm -hmm. in your skincare. I'm the kid that's like, but why? But why? (laughs) But why? Right? But I keep asking this to myself. Yes. And it's because I, Mm -hmm. if I can't understand how something works, I don't want to do it or use it. Mm -hmm. You don't trust it. Yes. You don't because you don't understand. Because I don't understand, Mm -hmm. and I get frustrated. Mm -hmm. So then I just became really obsessed with trying to understand what different ingredients did and why they did it. So it basically just became self-taught. And it was just, I'm the girl that will literally avoid work and go on her computer and rabbit hole into something I'm obsessed about. So there are days where like, if I was frustrated or stressed out because of work, Mm -hmm. I would just go into like skincare. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. And that's how like I started helping Marnie. And I would like, when we would go on these like company retreats, I would offer like lash lifts to the girls and like be like, do you want like a little mini facial? And so that's how I sort of became like a amateur subject matter expert and then why I would help people. And then, you know, my friend's like, why don't you do this for a living? Mm -hmm. And I just thought she was absolutely crazy. That's incredible because I have never heard of anyone dive so deep into a subject that they were that passionate about, like (laughs) just to completely obsess over it. And it even makes me wonder because when you left your corporate job, you were feeling like you deserved better and you were depressed in that environment. And like, even with the other offers that you had, you were like, I just don't feel good about it. Was it, do you think maybe it's because you just 
you want, you just, you knew what you felt like when things were really aligned and you were doing something that you really loved and yeah. these things maybe just didn't align. I think so. I think so. Aligning is a really big part of it. Right. So mm-hmm. in my, in my, ever since I started tech, which was at a really young age, mm-hmm. I did things because I was kind of okay at it. And I was like, oh yeah, like self-taught, I can do this, right? But the problem is you will hit a very early ceiling if that's all you want to do, right? So I have a really good friend. His name is Keith. He is very good at his job. And he, he I saw him climb from like customer support at Microsoft to now like, you know, director of like player experience at Epic Games. And it's he's the one that showed me like, oh, you should actually switch and go into cust or service Mm. because nobody wants to do it. And there's way more opportunity and growth in this segment. Did he see something in you that he felt was well, made it well suited for you? So, okay. So we talk about obsession. I was a, I I was a gamer. So we were all gamers. Mm -hmm. So something we're very good at doing is grinding, like finding a little thing and wanting to make it perfect. (laughs) And so we all played games together. So he was like, you're smart. You understand service side because as players in a game, you're constantly frustrated with the developers, especially if you're playing an online game. Mm -hmm. So we always knew what we hated when we had to deal with. As a player, you deal with customer service all the time because you're the ones complaining. (laughs) So he was like, you you already know how to do this. And he kind of knew my work history. But Keith is someone that was just like, I think you're smart. You'll figure it out. And you'd have more opportunity here. You'll have more growth uh, and you'll have more money. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay. So that and also I had a startup with uh, a few people and we were making like Facebook games and it did really well. But I... This is in 2008 or so. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had to basically do the customer stuff because Mm -hmm. everybody else were programmers, right? So I'm Mm -hmm. like, well, you guys are too busy being like programmer, programmer. I was, it was three engineers in me. So then I had to do all the other stuff. And I did the generalist. Yes. Pretty much. So mm-hmm. then I was all like, okay, I'm going to go and deal with the customers. So I think that's something in my career that I became was like a jack of all trades. Yeah. Um, but it never felt good to me. Mm. I always felt like maybe I wasn't actually good at my job because I think I wasn't actually interested in it. Yeah. So it was one of those things where it's like, okay, well, I can teach myself to be good at something because I want to be good at something. Also, because I don't like when people don't think I'm good at stuff. So I'm like, I have a lot to prove, right? And it sounds like the fact that you weren't specializing in something, that that was, that that didn't sit right with you. I, did you not like, did you not enjoy being a general generalist? So I did enjoy being a generalist because I really like to figure things out, mm. right? So I like... I like being useful. I like being able to go in and touch and everything. I also really like to understand how everything works. Mm. My brain is, it's very difficult for me to help any segment when I don't understand how the whole thing functions. Okay. Like I'll, I will literally go and chase somebody down and be like, I need you to explain this to me. Or like, how do we get these two things to work? So in a startup, generalists are the best in the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have to wear 10 million different hats. Right. You have to learn how to work with the different groups. And you, because also a lot of times you don't really know where you're going and yes. you're figuring it out. And yeah. so things change all the time. And your goals are always changing. <laughs> and a lot of it is like, I feel like in startups too, especially in early stages, nobody knows what's going on or what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of people that are ambitious and hungry. I'm good at figuring things out. I feel like that's a skill no one really talks about. Mm-hmm. But I, that's what I was good at. I was good at figuring things out. So that's always the jobs I had to, I was taking on. Like, mm-hmm. this is not working, figure it out. No one's ever done it before, figure it out. But there's a level of like, if the greater scope of that issue is not interesting to me, I get, I'm like, I don't want to do it. Mm. I have to force myself because it's my job, right? So then I use pressure to be effective, which is like waiting till the last minute or taking on more because I need pressure to make me function right so mm. I'm like I'm using my nervous system improperly right I basically trying to stimulate a fight or flight response to make myself go to motivate yourself to, mo- to, mo- to do the yes work. because what they say right like motivation is very difficult to come by it has to be very intrinsic if you want to be good at something oh. so I needed I forced in external issues wow. to make myself function and then I knew like why can't I just want to do this and then I would it would be so Your much better it wasn't in it it wasn't in it mm. so then I would always look at my own work critically and be like it is good I got the job done I'm hitting my goals 
But I would look at it knowing I wasn't giving 100% truly. I really wasn't. Like I was giving 100%, but not from my own internal engine. Right. And that's where and why I think I developed a lot of imposter syndrome. You know, I came up in like the 90s and the early 2000s. I just, it wasn't, it wasn't a, nor, it wasn't a hospitable place. Mm. I was constantly told I wasn't good enough. I was constantly told that my, you know, like, um, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. I was told that I wasn't going to make it. So there were so many external voices telling me that I wasn't shit. And even though a part of me was like, no, that's bullshit. A part of you will start to believe it because you're like, okay, all these successful people around you are telling you that you're not shit, but they're successful. Maybe it's true. So I was battling a lot of that in tech. Maybe I wasn't actually as good as I thought I was because I wasn't giving 100% mm -hmm. or I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. Like being happy is impactful, right? Like you bring energy into work where you're just kind of like a brat. Everyone's going to feel that. And I used to be very much like, no, this is my personality. This is just who I am. As I learned later, that's not my personality. That isn't who I am. But it's what I became from being in that environment. But I've always, I, I always wanted to really love my job and be good at it. And I remember my dad once told me, like, if you just become really good at it, you'll learn to love your job. But I think mm -hmm. there's an intersection. I think you have to have interest. Mm -hmm. So even if it's not like your greatest passion, if you're not interested in on, on, a, on some level, it's going to be very difficult to be great because you'll never have 100% of your own, like your own engine right. moving you forward. You're always going to have to rely on external pressure to make you like go. I did develop a bit of victimization mm. mindset, mm. which I loathe in anyone because it's, it's, it's victimization mindset stems from just basically deep insecurity and a lack of self-worth and stuff. And I've done a lot of work to not really feed that part of me. And you know, you are what you hang around, which is true. So if you hang around a bunch of people that don't believe in you, you won't amount to anything. Mm. It's very hard to. Yeah, I think it's, I think this really goes to show that it's so important to do work that is joyful. I think so. And makes you really happy. And also surrounding yourself with people who you feel good around. Yeah. And the environment and the people are really important. Yeah. When I look at it in retrospect and I talk to my friends mm. that are still doing well in tech, especially like people like, I always reference Keith Lott because he's very successful. And he would say things to me like, you're in the wrong company. Mm. If you worked at this type of company, you would thrive. You would do better. I think that's true, right? Yeah. Because the subject matter would change, like the work would change and the people would change. Yes, and also the validation, right? The like, culture would change. The culture would change. Because yeah. a big part of, like one, you have to have interest. I wasn't not interested in the work. I became interested in the work because it was challenging and it was novel. Mm. And if someone had been telling me, you're doing a great job, you're doing a good job, mm. then I would have started to enjoy the outcome of the work, mm. right? I think at the end of the day, I also deeply crave building something for myself. Mm -hmm. SD school would start as soon as I got back from my last family trip with my dad. So, and I told him in Japan what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, you know, he knew I quit my job and he wanted me to start my own company. And I told him, I'm going to go into aesthetics and I'm going to like, going to go into skincare. And I know what you're thinking. I go, but I'm going to figure out. Well, how he, to build my own company what did you think he was thinking like oh no you're gonna go work for someplace like milk and honey and like work you know not make money and work under somebody else because you're giving up on a challenging job mm. but i thought that's what he would think but he didn't think that because the mm. moment i told him he's all like he was very much like yeah you got this like good for you like he wasn't a man of a lot of words mostly he was excited to see that i was going to do something for myself and i was yeah. starting and he was like, yeah, you got this. Like, you can do this. And I was like, okay. Part of it is he was sick. So I think he wanted to see the best in things too. And then I even told like my sister and stuff. My sister loves skincare too. Mm -hmm. And she was just like, like, cool, do I'm, I'm, she's like, yeah, I think if you do it, you're going to be really, you're going to be very good at it, Jamie. So I was like, okay, cool. So like the two wow. people that mattered most to me didn't freak out at the idea and and it seems like you were concerned that they would freak out that they might yeah i and mean so, yes so what did so clearly they saw something in you and they believed in you is that is that a way that you think about it now mm. when you look back i think so like my dad once told me you know when we were sitting down for dinner because i was like a entrepreneur i was like trying to always start my own businesses he told me that i was doing it the right way 
because my sister and my brother work for other people. Mm. My dad is real big on like, you got to be your own. You got to like, you're, you're never going to be able to have any meaningful amount of money if you work for other people. Mm. You have to work for yourself. And I was the only one who kind of wanted to do it. When I dreamed about work or when I dreamed about my future, it was never like, I'm going to work for this big company. It was always like, I'm going to do something really cool that I love that's like creative and I'm going to do it on my own terms. I definitely was a, I was a, I was definitely was a don't tell me what to do kid. I'm the youngest. <laughs> I relate to that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, one, I'm the youngest. But two, I think, you know, just I, I'm a latchkey kid. So I grew up alone a lot. So I'm always, I was always like, figuring things out to do on my own because, you know, back then we, boredom was like a wonderful resource, right? So I was bored all the time. So I would always like do things that I thought were interesting or fun and they were always mm-hmm. creative and that always made me happier. Mm-hmm. I loved working with my hands. I loved cooking. Anything that I could create with my hands made me feel good. And, um, you know, I feel like especially especially Asians in America, when you come from immigrants, they want you to move away from working with your hands, mm-hmm. right? They they want you to move away from blue collar work and move towards white collar work because that's what our ge- parents or previous generations immigrated away from their homelands yes. to also escape. like escape yes yeah. and safety right like because mm. if you hurt your hands you can't work oh, yeah. right there's there's no and also to be tr- it, truthfully right most most of the way immigrants see financial gain is in white collar jobs like mm-hmm. right? being a doctor being a lawyer like high paying high education positions Mm -hmm. even though the truth is like the biggest money makers are people that own like plumbing businesses and like you know like but they didn't know that we didn't know that stuff yet right so we're always trying to achieve academically and honestly i was just not a good student so after you told your dad and your sister that you were going to start sd school yeah (laughs) what was what was your next step so um then i started looking at all the different schools and, you know, I thought going to SD school would be like going to university. Like I was really going to go and learn and it was going to make me amazing. Like I thought it was going to be much more specific in making you proficient than what it turned out to be. Huh. What was it actually? Oh, it's just literally me and a bunch of high school girls, half who don't even know what they want to do in life mm. uh, and learning the basics, mostly learning how to, learning how to pass. Uh, licensing tests but i will say i will attribute this she's my friend today bethany she was my instructor when you have an instructor who is passionate about teaching and is also incredibly knowledgeable like we're friends to this day and it's because we we cared a lot about like knowing how things worked she's like um she's like a professional teacher meaning like she's a professional student that learns so that she can teach that's all she does that's what she's excellent at right so she was my instructor and also i think because we were similar in age we also not in school after school became friends because we could like relate and i think i took it very seriously and i think teachers love students that take your take it seriously it's so much more fun to teach someone that's into everything and taking it serious than like a bunch of kids that are there just it's engaging as engaging for them as it is for you. yeah so i think we helped each other there so i think that relationship was very positive for me so then I think what I felt in school that let me know that this is what I wanted to do for sure was it was a space where suddenly I could be really good at something um, and I had like internal motivation to want to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I met like-minded people that were also really excited about it. And then it was validating because I knew I almost, I, I didn't know everything, but very little of it was like, Oh, I didn't know that. Mostly it was like, oh, yes, this information is like this. This information is very tasty to me because it's like feeding the parts of me that already kind of knew about this stuff. Uh So it's like, oh, it helped me connect things I didn't really understand before that. Mm -hmm. Like I knew ingredient stacks. I knew histology and physiology. So going into SD school, how did you fund it? And did you have some money safe? Yeah. So when I looked at the cost for SD school, it was actually like $13,000. And for me at the time... I could easily pay that out of pocket because I had saved enough money. And then I basically had to decide because then I I started to get a little afraid. Like, no, like this is money I need to save to retire. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be spending it. But then I think savings is not just about retiring. Savings is about having money to do what you want to do. And then I thought, 
I believed in myself enough to be like, no, no, no. The savings is supposed to be here to save me when I need it. And I need it right now. Mm. So I felt very comfortable just tapping into it and using it to do what I wanted to do. At the end of the day, I know I can go get a job anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, like I can go work for someone for $25. I'll go work at Starbucks. I don't care. Right. At the end of that, that's what my sister taught me. Do what you have to do to make things happen for yourself. Don't have too much pride to go just make money somewhere. So I knew at the end of the day, I would never be like completely like destitute and have mm-hmm. no options. And more than anything, I knew I could always go back to tech. I think you hit on something really key there that I felt as well was that knowing that I had backups made me more confident in betting in my, on myself. Yeah. Because I'm like, I, I have no reason not to give it my all because I'll, I know I'll always be okay. Yeah. And also, I will say this. I am not afraid of being poor. (laughs) I've been poor most of my life. Mm. You know, one thing my dad did for me, a magical gift, was he never took away my struggle entirely. He would save me if I really needed it, but he knew that I had to learn how to swim on my own. Learning how to like live paycheck to paycheck or living with less, Mm -hmm. I got good at that. I'm still pretty good at it. So like, lucky for me, Having people constantly tell me that I couldn't do things or like, dude, I've been fired from so many jobs. I have zero fear of being fired. I have zero <laughs> fear of being out of work because I know I can go get a job. I love that. So like, I'm not afraid of being poor. Yeah. So I'm not afraid of, and also it's, I think it's risk, right? Mm-hmm. I don't have a house. I don't have mm-hmm. children. So I wasn't, worst case scenarios, I got to go back to tech and get a regular job and make average money. Which you already know how to do. Yeah. And it's not a bad right. life. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't work, then I'll figure it out when that, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. there's always going to be problems. I'll deal with the problems when I get to the problem. Until yeah. then, I'm just going to move. So. And is that how you approach starting the business too? Because you had never started a business. <sighs> you, you were just like, let's figure it out. Like, what, what did you decide? How did you know what to do next? I was a founder in a very, very small startup. So I understood mm-hmm. at least right. like, you have to form an LLC. Uh, You need an accountant. So I knew immediately I wasn't going to try to do that by myself because then I would get myself into trouble because I am not good at that. Mm. And I was like, okay, I know immediately I'm just going to hire somebody to help me file the LLC and then to also file my taxes for me. And then I'll just worry about making money. I wasn't even thinking about making a business. I was thinking about creating a job for myself. Mm. So I thought about honestly, like what I was going to do in the beginning Like I had so many ideas of how I was going to make money. I'm going to bring skincare to the masses. Mm. I'm going to be the affordable esthetician. (laughs) I'm going to make it so that anyone can access really good skin health and products. I wish that was viable. It's not. I tried it. I had to work so hard. I was not making any money. I was burning out. I was in like my first year and I'm like, oh yeah, we can't do it this way. Mm. So then, you know, then then you like deal with like reality, right? So it's like, there's what you want to do, there's how you want to do it, and then there's the real world that you have to exist in. I think a lot of times people don't want to acknowledge this part, which is probably the most important part. The real world. The real part. world. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was lucky enough for whatever reason, you know, I had coworkers who knew my personality and they're like, well, if Jamie's doing this, she's going to be really good at it. So they would come and visit me. Even though I had limited hands-on experience, um, but I can talk about skincare. I can explain things to you. So immediately I'm doing better than almost 90% of the estheticians out there mm-hmm. because most of them can't talk about it. I took my first client on December 20th. Mm. I was working at a home. And the way I was working when I first started was I just knew it doesn't matter. I knew that me and success was time. I just needed time. I knew and I and I would I was like, okay, 10 years. You will see meaningful success in 10 years. That's how it takes most company. 10 years before you really see. a a big return on your commitment. So I just knew it was just between now and 10 years. Or, and 10 years to become a master at at any sort of art form. 10,000 hours, yes. I just knew I just needed to work. Mm. I just needed to touch bases. You just needed experience, Yes, hands-on experience. So in the beginning, because I had savings and because the world was still normal, I literally worked for tips only. I would Mm. be like, donation-based. You just pay. to get people into the door. Just to get people into the door. I'm all like, hey, do you want a facial? Come wow. get a facial. And I would, I didn't care. I just wanted to work on faces. And, you know, I was lucky enough because of my former coworkers. They would be like, 
well, how much do I tip you? How much do I pay you? And I'm like, oh, no, it's whatever you think it's worth. And they're like, well, I don't know what this is worth. How much would you charge normally? <laughs> and then I was like, oh, no, I don't know how much I would charge because I didn't. My thing is this. I felt really bad taking money because I wasn't an expert yet. I was like, no, 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 I'm just practicing. Yeah. But you have to make money. I think that's a challenge for a lot of people who are starting out in business is they're afraid to ask for what one what they think it's worth and two i think they people struggle with ca- value valuing what their worth is yeah it's, and i and i think it's undetermined to them and i'm yeah. definitely someone you know um i think one of my good traits is i can have an ego when i started working i just knew i needed to touch faces and i won't lie to you helen every time i did a facial i'm like oh i'm good at this hmm. Part of me kept always saying, like, I'm really good at this. I'm really good at this, which is really funny to think about because I'm like, sub- I'm like, You're just- I-, I tell people who haven't come back to me since I started, like, you should come back. <laughs> I'm like really good now. And then even then I'm like, oh, man, in five more years, I'm going to be even better. Yeah. And that's exciting to me I is knowing like, because I'm seeing how good I am yeah. day over day. Week over week. You're tracking the progress yeah, and, constantly. And I can feel it. Mm. And I can see it. Yeah. So that's the best part is I'm actually seeing me being good at it actually works out because then it's giving me people like you. It's giving me it's giving me access to so many wonderful human beings that I'm like, wow, like <laughs> sometimes I don't think it's real. Wow. Like sometimes I don't think this is like I'm like shocked. I'm like, oh I am I'm I'm doing really well. But I don't like to think about, I don't focus on like doing well. I, I think it's a distraction. So, but can you talk about some of those, um, like measures for how you knew you were doing well, how you knew things were working Mm. because it seems like very quickly after you started the business, like it, it just took off, like it kind of in very short amount of time, three years, like your business has exploded. What were those measures that told you that things were working out, especially early on? So COVID hit. I was doing facials in my house. That had to go away real fast. Mm. I had to sit on the couch for like three months. And then I'm like, oh my God, I just gave up a tech job where everyone can work from home for a job that requires people in person. And we're all going to die from COVID, right? Like that's where everybody. (laughs) And then I was like, I ruined my life. What am I doing? So I spiraled very briefly. And then my wonderful friend, Natalie, was all like, no, Jamie, you could do this. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, I can do this. So this is what I mean. Like, you got to surround yourself with people that believe in you. So my best friends, Natalie and Jen, literally were telling me, you can do this. Don't quit. They were both trying to give me money. They're like, no, no, no. We'd rather give you our money Mm -hmm. than let you quit. We're not letting you quit. So they would literally send they would literally send money from their own pockets because they didn't want me to quit in COVID. Mm. Because and they're like, this is temporary. Without taking services? No. They were like Jen lived in, you know, Jen lived in uh, California. Oh. And, you know, Natalie would take services, but she was like, she literally walked in with a check for ten thousand dollars one day and was like, here. And the thing is, I'm also that friend. Like if you if I believe in you and you need something, I'm gonna give you everything I can. So it's like it's weird being on the receiving end of it. And so I had to I had to remind myself that the people that you want to keep closest to you that you admire are mirrors. They see you more clearly than you can see yourself. Mm, and you so have to true. trust the way they see you. So in that time when I was freaking out and um, I didn't know what to do, and my dad is gone at this point, and I didn't want to scare anybody, and I didn't want to scare myself anymore. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to go back to tech was I turned off my own brain and I just trusted the way my best friends saw me because I think they're the best people in the world. Mm. So why wouldn't the way they see me be the truth? And then it quieted the self-doubt. It quieted the self-hatred because I'm like, they believe in me. So just go with this. And then, then, so then to make, so the reason why I set small goals at first is because I was afraid. So I'm like, okay, I just want to work. I just want to touch faces. Mm. I'm going to take tons of models. I'm going to record them and I'm going to have content. So like my Instagram, I would update every day. There would be a face on there every day. Whether or not that person paid me, it didn't matter. I just needed to work. And then, you know, every two or three clients, someone would pay me. And I'm like, I remember like it'd be Tuesday and I'd come home and I'm like, I paid rent this week. (laughs) 
<laughs> and then everything else is gravy, right? Mm. So I didn't, I didn't care anymore. I didn't worry about it. But then the gravy started becoming more and more and more. And then I'm like, oh, wow, like I made enough to pay for the whole month and I'm only halfway through. So at first it was just like the small wins because then, you know, it's like um, it helped me just like push the it, it would I would push out the goal further and further and further. Mm -hmm. Me as a person, I understand risk by how it makes my body feel, mm. how it makes my mind feel and how it makes me daydream. Yeah, mm. I dream positively. And when I'm in that space, I get into like a flow state. Wow. So I've been learning a lot of things from like what this feeling, like how do I know I'm good or how do I know I'm doing the right things? That. You check in with your gut. It's just something inside of my body all is telling me you got this because I don't have sounds like, because I feel like you, your body will tell you when you should be afraid. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, part of me thrives having purpose. Um, I'm happiest in that place. I'm positive in this place. It makes me kinder it makes me more loving purpose gives my life not only meaning but like positive meaning it's made everything in my life so much better including how i see myself mm -hmm. how i see other people and it's brought a really you know like when they say the energy you put out into the world is the energy you get back yeah. it's true it's a hundred percent true so true it's true enough time has passed in my life that when i doubled down on those feelings of knowing they return to me goodness. I sound so woo right now. I hate the words coming out of my mouth. But it's... I love it. <laughs> so, but that's literally what's happening. So living in the moment, I've learned, is a really good thing. So I used to have a ton of depression and anxiety when I was in tech. And that's because I wasn't ever living in the present. I was only ever trying to get through... Like, I didn't want to be present because present wasn't feeling good. So I was always, always trying to think of the future, which is anxiety. Or I was living in the past, which is depression, right? And it wasn't a good feeling. In this space, when I touch your skin, when I work on you, I am so in the moment. Mm -hmm. I connect with you guys. We have these stimulating and beautiful conversations. I see you. You see me. And I'm living in the moment. And that exchange of actually being really present and being super intentional, including how I work on you guys, being perfect, making moments perfect, is a collection of perfect moments that turns into something greater, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like... This is, this is Japanese culture. If everything you do is done to the best of your ability, no matter how small, folding a napkin, how I do my laundry, how I set my table, every moment is perfect because I'm being so intentional because that perfection returns to me greatness, mm -hmm. right? It gives me purpose. You look at my suite, it's immaculate. On purpose. Because when you enter my space, you know that I've done everything possible to make you feel welcome. You're entering a space that you know that I give 100% to. You know that translates into me giving you 100%. If you came into a room of disarray, you'd be all like, oh my God, what, who is this person who's mm -hmm. touching my face? So I show you in everything or in myself, every, every moment up to the point you walk into my door, I've made or I've given perfect intention. I try to. Mm -hmm. I'm not always, but I do... Maybe that day I can only give 60% of my perfect intention because I'm dealing with whatever. I still give as much as I possibly can. And it translates. Like nothing is beneath me, even doing the dishes. The ritual of things has really helped me mm. with everything that I've done. If you turn everything into a ritual, if you turn everything into like a practice that you do to perfection, you're going to see return. Um, and it's just something that I started with and it is working. So I think that's, that's it. That's like other SDs ask me like, like, oh, you know, they want advice. and like, how do you like, how have you built your business? And I just tell them, oh, just like, just be good. Just focus on being good. And they think it's like the most annoying response. And they think it's like disrespectful or I don't want to help them. But it's literally just that. Like, mm -hmm. how good is your cleansing? How good was your removal of the cleanser? So you're striving for excellence because you really care. You really just care that much. You really just want an excellent experience for the client, for yourself, because it's almost like the way I'm hearing you say, it's like, what is the point otherwise? Yes. <laughs> if I know I gave a hundred percent to everything I did that day, I feel good. I don't, mm. that self doubt doesn't creep in. So if I'm trying my best in that service with whoever I'm working on to be perfect, and to give you my 100%, 
then I know at least at the end of the day, I did my best. Like, And that makes you feel really good. Yes, because before I used to be like, I'm trying. Mm. I'm trying. I have to catch myself because when I have a personal trainer. Chris, I love him. <laughs> I'll do this thing where he'll say something. He's like, ready? I'm like, I'll try. I go, nope. I'm going to do, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to do my best. So I don't like to say trying anymore. Cause to me, trying is like setting yourself, your brain up for like, it's okay if you don't do well. Mm-hmm. It's not okay. It's so interesting because the way you treat one thing is the way that you treat everything in your life. I try to. Yes. Yeah. So I try very hard to live. So I used to be someone that had values that didn't always live in them Mm. i've had friends in the past call me out like jamie you have this standard that you put everyone to and you're not even living it Mm. and i'm like oh that's so true right so and now you embody it i try very hard i try very hard because it's the only way i can look in the mirror and feel good about who i am and it makes me proud to be who i am more importantly it's you know like it's it's heritage. It's my family. It's my dad. It's my mom. It's my sister. It's like, I don't represent just me. You represent everybody that came before you. You represent everything that touches you. So if I can be someone who actually lives in my values, then that's someone worthy of all the good things touching it. Mm. So I think that's the thing is like, I have so much goodness. So I need to make sure that I keep it and I'm always earning it. Yeah. And I can only do that when... You show when up. When capable, mm-hmm. I could show up. Mm-hmm. And I can't always. There are times where I can't. And I think that's human. But that's the other thing. Because I know I'm doing it almost all the times that I can, when I can, I'm so, I actually forgive myself now. Mm-hmm. Like working out. I hate mm-hmm. working out. <laughs> working out has really taught me how to like not negative self talk. I used to negative self talk all the time. And I used to be like, oh, it's my humor, self deprecating. I still do it. When I think it's appropriate, but I used to like want someone to yell at me when I was exercising. Now I don't. I hate it. Don't. I don't want to be talked down to. I don't like it. I'm like, who are you talking to? You know what I mean? Because now I like myself. I'm proud of myself. So no, you can't talk to me like that. And I can't talk to myself like that. And I do want my personal trainer's validation. So we say things like, well, you shouldn't want external validation. I don't think that's true. I think having external validation is important. And I think it's natural for us as human beings. It is. Because we're social creatures. Yes. You just have to make sure that the person that's giving you validation is someone worthy to give you validation, right? In building your business and growing it and getting it to where it is today, like you've obviously overcome a lot of conditioning and you've done a lot of self-healing too. Yes. (laughs) Do you reckon, were you conscious of all of this as it was happening or is it more that you see it now in hindsight? And I, I ask this to g- help give people some perspective. Maybe they're in the middle of it as well. Like, what can people look out for to know that they are healing, that they are making that progress and overcoming these this conditioning and these old habits that we have to to really step into our full potential? Because that that's what you did. So just looking back, is mm. that was it? Were you conscious of it even? So yes. So I, uh, I don't want to talk because I feel like I'm going to cry now. <laughs> so that's something that's happened. So my dad died. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say when I'm not sad, by the way, I just cry anytime I'm overwhelmed with feeling good or bad. So when I think about my dad, I want to cry all the time. Um, and I think it's a gift. I think it releases you. Like, basically, I don't hold in things I shouldn't hold in because it doesn't serve me. So when I think about my dad, I always want to cry. So sometimes I don't like to talk about it because it makes other people uncomfortable. But I think like you and I are good. So if you're all watching and I'm making you uncomfortable, don't worry about it. I'm good. (laughs) You should be good too. Tears are good. Um, When my dad died, it was the worst feeling and loss I ever experienced because my dad was the only person in my life I knew that I could always count on to save me. And that was a trap. So when he died, he gave me his last gift, which is what freed me from thinking that anyone but myself was going to save me. And up until that point, I had been living my life that I just need someone to come along and believe in me. I just need someone to come along and give me this job that I deserve. I just need someone. I just needed somebody, not myself, to come along and give me permission to do 
anything, feel anything, be anything. And when he died, I knew that wasn't true anymore. I knew that at that point in my life, nobody was going to save me. And that if I wanted anything, I had to just get over my shit and do it. Mm. And I know it's terrible to lose your parents, but sometimes that's the gift. So I try not to be sad about it because I don't want to be sad. Like I am sad he's gone, but also he's not gone. I am, he's, he's in me. He spent his whole life raising me. And of course I'm going to be successful. I'm his daughter. And that is what freed me. And I feel like, you know, you don't need someone to die for you to see that. It's just how it worked for me. And I think for most people, everyone is looking or waiting for some luck or some saving. Luck doesn't come to you. You find luck. You create luck. That's something my dad believed in. Luck is something you generate for yourself. It doesn't fall into your lap. You have to create every circumstance for it to want to be present. I think for a lot of people, it's because you keep waiting for someone else to do the favor for you and no one's going to do anything for you but yourself. No one can save you. And I think that's basically when he passed away. And like, I didn't have a job, like everything, like I lost everything all at once. But it was such a like huge, it was like a nuclear bomb went off. And suddenly I didn't have room for any of that shit. Because life is short. So, you know, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you don't think about time like that. And then you get into your 40s and you start to do a little bit. And then you start losing your loved ones. And you realize that our time on earth is so, it's so, it's so finite. It's so quick before you know it, we're all gone and I don't have time to waste anymore. And so I live every moment choosing to be like, not happy. I think, I think thinking you're supposed to be happy all the time is also a trap. You should feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You should feel proud. You should feel honest. You should feel all your values. So for me, it's like loyalty, commitment to myself and the people I love. And it's excellence. Those are the things I value. So that's what I live in every single day. And it's paying off. So the secret, I, like, why am I, 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 I think it's just because for the first time in my life, because of everything that came before, you know, life has determined, like, all of these things have taught you the lesson. Are you going to learn it or not? Are you going to take it or not? And I'm just, I'm choosing to say yes. No one's going to save you. That's really it. Like, you just have to understand that life is not fair. It's not supposed to be. And sometimes life not being fair is the best part about life because it's going to teach you all the lessons you need to know. Pain is an instrument. Loss is an instrument. You can't have good without bad. You have to have both. And when you have enough bad, you can make good knowing that you're also going to have bad again. Like, avoiding bad things is, I think, part of, like, the falls, pitfalls for a lot of people. Things are not going to work. They shouldn't always work. How do you excel? How do you learn if things are always working? You don't know, you don't know boundaries. You don't know capacity. So like for me, I just don't care, right? Like, oh, that's what I want to do. I'm going to go do it. Uh, it didn't work out. Pivot. Mm -hmm. Or like, ah, that's why it didn't work. But my brain is always thinking of like, how do I make things better? And knowing that if in this moment it's not better, it's one step closer to better because now I know that's not the way, right? Everything is like, it's like a every decision you make fragments into 20 other decisions. Just keep going down the one and then find the one you like. And if you don't like one, try one again. You know what I mean? So I just do that over and over and over. And it's fun. I love novel. And if you focus novel on one thing in one area, you will be excellent. You can find excellence in it. I don't know. I just try to be intentional and be happy. But there's still room for, you know, there's old me. There's lazy Jamie that wants to lay on the couch and watch TV for 12 hours. Or, you know take a week off to play Diablo 4 with my friends. <laughs> I do it less and less because, you know, those used to be escapes, but I don't mm -hmm. want to escape my life much anymore. Mm -hmm. Now it's more like recovery versus escape. But yeah, like, I'm finally applying that to every part of my life, my relationships, my friendships, myself. Like, I have a personal trainer. I still struggle with, like, why am I paying my... I, I think about that. So, you know, I'm still old me. Like, oh my God, I'm spending so much money. Of course... Why wouldn't I want to spend all my money on me? I'm the You're most important thing. In yourself. That's right. Yeah, like it's I'm literally life, the most money. important thing. We're mm -hmm. all our, as individuals, you're the most important thing in your mm -hmm. life. Shouldn't you be investing in that, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, I'm trying, I try to eat better. Mm -hmm. I work out now right, very regularly. I hate it, but I love it at the same time. It does make your mind sharper. It does reduce depression. 
It reduces all the bad things in your life. There's way too much anxiety in modern day life. I don't, I try to stay off my phone. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I'm just doing, hey, I, I watch a lot of podcasts <laughs> and it's all the same. Look, look at every single successful person. They all do the same thing. They take care of their body. They take care of their mind and they keep positive and good relationships around them. Mm-hmm. And then you thrive, right? Like it's very easy. It's so special easy to fail it's like and when i say fail i mean like it's so easy to not show up it's so easy to blame everybody around you as to why your life isn't working out it's so much harder to be accountable for every aspect of your life including owning the fact that all the bad things that happened to you you played a part and i'm not saying like oh you know blame the victim or whatever it's it's a radical honesty followed by radical ownership Yes, that works for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to lead this way. (laughs) People don't like it. But I think think it's useful. And it's useful for me. And it's going to be useful to anyone that wants to own their business. Mm -hmm. You can't blame anybody. You have to know that like, like the buck stops with you, right? That's a true statement. And you have to find all the points in which you control every part. Like you control the vast majority of things in your life in terms of like your actions, right? You can't control a lot of it, but you can control you. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, just control yourself. Stop spending time thinking about what other people are doing. And, you know, know that no one's going to save you and you just have to do it yourself. Mm. And unfortunately that's work. And if you don't like work, well, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) Learn to like it. I've learned, I love it. So this is probably a really great segue to the last question, which is, for someone starting out in this business, or maybe let's say for someone starting out as an esthetician, mm. whether it's in as their own business owner or working for someone else, what advice, what words of wisdom would you give them? So I think this is important to point out, like there's 90 million ways to make money as an esthetician. Mm. If you want to be a facialist, if you want to be hands-on working as a skincare expert, You have to know that what everyone else is doing on the internet doesn't matter. I've never advertised. I've never advertised. You've never paid for advertising. I've never paid for advertising. Mm -hmm. I've never paid for marketing. Um, I don't even have that many reviews. Mm -hmm. But people are always trying to get on my books. Uh, I met some really, really cool people. You know, um, you just have to do the work. You have to give the time, which is like I see Estes who sit around without clients, hmm. do a model call, what's work that, on, what's a model work call? on, work, work for free. Hmm. Cause it's not free, right? It's t- like, people are always worried about their time in exchange for money, mm-hmm. right? That I don't want to give away my time yes. if I'm not getting paid for it. But skill translates to money as well, right? So if I can't make money today, I'm going to invest in the skill that will make money tomorrow. Mm. So I think if you want to be an esthetician and you want to succeed, be busy, meaning work for free. Like, work for, yeah, work for free. Do model calls. Be like, hey, I'm working on these facials. And in exchange, you have to let me record you. You have to let me take a bunch of pictures. Why? Because this means the service is going to be interrupted, right? Like, it's not a complete facial in that, like, you know, I give you my best, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to take pictures. I'm going to move the camera, mm-hmm. you know, offer discounts. Um, I will say, though, I don't ever discount. I don't believe in discounting. But for some girls, it will work. But more importantly is just keep working. So when I say I don't offer discounts, I think that's an important distinction is you need to take yourself seriously. You have to treat yourself the way you see. Like if you want to be taken seriously, you have to take yourself seriously first. I take myself when it comes to work. I take myself very, very seriously. And to me, model calls have I think you have to think that you're giving gifts, right? Mm -hmm. I think a model call is an opportunity for you to come get the best facial in town, right? That's how you have to think about it. And you do have to believe in yourself. You have to. mm -hmm, Like you're going to give your best service even if it's a free model call. Every single Mm -hmm. time I'm telling you, even in school, if I just keep doing this, because I could feel the progress. Mm -hmm. If I just keep doing this, oh my God, I'm going to be so good. I just knew it. I just knew because I could tell it was the thing that I really liked. And the novelty, the whole point of being successful is like, I need to constantly create novelty, but I create it on top of what I love. Meaning like, This is why I'm always innovating. This is why I'm always looking for the best technology. This is why I'm more importantly is 
I focus heavily on my processes and my protocols and I fine tune them. I'm a min maxer. You come to me because you've gotten your skin 80% from someone else. You want to get to 100. I get you from 80 to 100. That's why people like to come to me because I spend all my time in that space. The smallest things help. Oh, well, I do this. I do this maneuver. I work on this a little longer. I'm always trying to fine tune the process because I take it very seriously. So if you want to be in this space and you want to succeed without all the technology and you want to succeed without relying on your store and you want to just be able to know that at the end of the day you can make money with your hands, it's get your hands on as many faces as possible. Always be working. Never be sitting idle. Take as many clients as you can whether or not they're paying you or not because eventually it will come. Mm -hmm. And be patient. If you're young, your perception of time is very different, but I promise you it's going to pass by faster than you know. You've just unpacked what that means. There's so much more to it than just working hard. Yeah. And I think it's those details and that nuance that a lot of people forget and they miss yeah. when they hear those words. So. Jamie, you are just such a fountain of wisdom. <laughs> I am so grateful for you coming onto this podcast, sharing your story, sharing your experience. And I think it's going to be really helpful for anyone who wants to live to their fullest potential, who wants to feel joy and purpose in their work, who is on that journey searching for it, because I feel like you've just touched on so many of those the gnarly parts of navigating mm. the journey to get to that point. So I'm just, I'm so, I'm, I'm so inspired by you. And I, I, we could just, I mean, we've talked about this. Yeah. For we could so just sit much, here paying each other compliments for, all day. We could just talk forever. And yeah. honestly, like, um, this is, this is one where I, I haven't talked very much because I could literally just listen to you talk. Uh, all I get so day. subconscious because I talk so much, <laughs> but it, there's so much, there's so much wisdom that you share and, I just think it's so valuable. So I think that's that's why when I'm with you, a lot of times I'm just like, tell me more. <laughs> and then what? <laughs> so Well, I mean Thank you so much. Well, thank you. You know, you're part you're you are a big part of why I'm here because mm -hmm. I get because I've met people like you. That's sweet of you know you what I mean? Say. It's it's important. You gotta have the right people in your corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it means so much to me that you were listening this deep into the episode and and I am just so grateful to be able to share these conversations with you. If you would like to support me and my work here on the podcast, please subscribe wherever you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, and please leave a rating and review. It means so, so much. And it really does mean a lot in getting the podcast out in front of more people. So thank you so much for your support. I'm so grateful for you listening in, and I will talk to you in the next one. Bye, guys.